Welcome to the podcast from Central Congregational Church. Thank you for joining today. I hope this message from our church this week is grounding and inspiring, challenging and encouraging, and a helpful reminder that you are loved by God and called to great things. If we haven't met before, my name is Patrick. I'm one of the pastors here at Central Congregational Church, and I am so grateful to be the one to welcome you not only to this space, but to this time that's been set apart for the worship of God. Uh, It's been a week. Maybe for you, it's been a great week. Maybe for you, that's been like the worst week you've ever had. Probably somewhere in the middle, all of us sit. It carries some heaviness some lightness, we bring some joys and concerns. All of us bring a lot of clutter, a lot of baggage into this space. And it's really the reason that we gather each week. We are people living normal, complicated lives alongside one another and trust that there is a God who continues to lead us. So if your week was great, thank God. If your week was hard, welcome. (laughs) God is in control. God is caring for us, holding us compassionately. God can be seen in the kind eye of the neighbor sitting next to you in the pew. And in the, or maybe they're not looking at you kindly, that's okay. And it's in the person past them. Find the friendly eye, that's where God is. But more than anything, folks, I'm really just grateful to be here. I'm grateful to be with you and really grateful for you reminding me of all the good ways that God shows up in our community. Um, There's a lot that's coming up in the life of the church. Uh, You may know already that Easter is on the way, which is great news. It also means that we're in the season of Lent, which is also a really important and sacred time. So rather than jumping all the way ahead, there's some really great ways to look with anticipation to the resurrection. Uh, some, one of those ways is by making beautiful art. Uh, next week, after worship, we're going to be hanging out in Chapel Hall painting eggs. Uh, you can see more information about that in the bulletin, so I hope you will take that home with you to look uh, for instructions on how to, how to empty the egg of its contents without breaking that egg so that we can paint them to hold on to uh, as, as a part of... Um, our, our work as a congregation here. I also, there's an there's a insert in your bulletin about Easter memorial flowers, uh, so you can see information about how to make sure that you have flowers to put onto our communion table and around our communion table for uh, Easter. There's all sorts of ways to be connected. In fact, every single week until Easter, we'll have Wednesday evening programs to hear Uh, testimony and meditation in our uh, Wilson Chapel, which is in the sanctuary, but it's in that part of the sanctuary. That's our Wilson Chapel. We'll have a meditation, some time for prayer there, and then a conversation about how poverty is affecting our city and some tangible ways that we might be able to respond to it as a community of faith. So those conversations will continue throughout the season of Lent, and I hope that you will come to join in those conversations and to take part in our community's work. Uh, having said all that, I want to actually bring Jeff up to talk a little bit about stewardship. Whoop, whoop, whoop. <laughs> okay. Morning, Jeff Stewardship. Uh, how are you? Just a reminder that after uh, coffee hour today, it is our second annual scavenger hunt. Uh, it'll be fun, easy. There's pizza and beverages and snacks for everyone. So we hope to see you there. Um, if I see you in the congregation today, but you don't participate in the scavenger hunt, I will personally be assessing a 10% increase to your pledge. Um, So maybe I I don't want you to participate. Um, We'll we'll figure that out. Hope to see you uh, afterwards. Thank you. Good morning. The reading today is from John chapter 2, verses 13 through 22. It can be found on page 93 of your pew Bible. I'll be reading from the new Revised Standard Version edition. <clears throat> the Passover of the Jews was near, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple, he found people selling cattle, sheep, and doves, and the money changers started seated at their tables. Making a whip of cords, he drove them all out of his temple 
with the sheep and the cattle. He poured out the coins of money changers and turned their tables. He told those who were selling doves, take these things out of here. Stop making my father's house a marketplace. His disciples remember that it was written, zeal for your house will consume me. The Jews then said to him, what sign can you show us for doing this? Jesus answered, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. The Jews said, this temple has been under construction for 46 years and you will raise it up in three days? But he was speaking of the temple of his body. After he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this, and they believed the scripture and the word of Jesus had spoken. May God bless this reading to our hearing and understanding. Please be seated. Would you all pray with me? Holy God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts here be acceptable and pleasing in your sight, O oh God, our rock and our redeemer, so that whether it's because of me or even in spite of me, it would still be your word that is faithfully proclaimed and your name that is glorified. Amen. This passage always leaves me with a lot of really sort of weird, mixed feelings. There's a part of me that wants to cheer on everything that Jesus is doing, right? We want to be on Jesus' side. So the idea that there could be such an injustice in the temple that people would be exchanging money and selling goods, we all want to rally behind Jesus and say, those people were clearly, clearly going the wrong direction. And then there's another part of me that's like, wait, is that me that he's driving out? Why would Jesus go into one holy space concerned with the ways that they're operating their business as a business and then not look also into the church and wonder in a stewardship season? how we're operating the business as a business. It's complicated and messy. I've been having a lot of conversation. For those of you who don't know, who may be newer even than me, I've been here for now, I think, seven weeks, really, officially. Um, I started uh, in the middle of January and have been around for just a little bit of time. And one of the conversations that I've been starting to have with folks is asking, What is the church for? What exactly are we here for? What is Central's purpose? But even bigger than that, what is like the church, capital T, capital C, what is the church for? And I'm getting actually pretty consistent answers. You may already have them in your head. Um, Many people have said it's to be a part of a like-minded community. People like the sense of being a part of something bigger than themselves, which is a good thing. People want to feel like they're having an impact on the world. It's a good thing. People want to have a break from the mess of the world around us to be a part of a community that's focused on one thing. That's a good thing. That's a beautiful thing. What I've noticed, and in each of these conversations I've pointed it out, there's no secret here. What I've noticed is even the way I talk about what the church is for, because I would use the same language, we often leave out the most important part of church. Could you guess what it is? God, Jesus, the Spirit. It's all like, I think, under the surface. But why do we go to church? It's under layers of community well-being, of being a part of something bigger, of wanting to be a part of a like-minded community of people, wanting to have an impact on the world, all things that I think are guided by the Spirit. But you see, the focus is flipped. Why do we go to church to attune to God? 
who might call us to have an impact on the world, to attune to God who we might come to know through people sitting next to us in a pew on Sunday or working next to us in the food pantry throughout the week? How, why do we come to church to listen to the Spirit that might be calling us to do something different than we've done before? And that, in turn, will be make it the case that we're a part of something bigger than we thought that we were a part of. You see that we just have the focus flipped a little bit sometimes. And when I say we, I'm including myself, like this isn't a, you've done something terrible. This is just the way that we think, because what is normal in our society is for us to have our own particular kind of agency to be a part of a community, to have an impact on the world. And so often in our places of work, in our places of life, in our homes, in our families, in our lives, we keep God underneath the layers of the rest of our lives, undergirding perhaps, but not the central focus. So to really understand what Jesus is doing with the temple, I think we have to take a little bit of a step step backwards. Um, You'll come to know this is my favorite thing to do, but uh, you already are, I get it, I'm sorry. I think it's important to understand what the temple was built for. You may remember uh, there are stories from the book of Exodus about how the people of Israel had ended up as slaves in Egypt. Well, after that emancipation from Egypt and slavery there, they went on a walk through the wilderness where they encountered all sorts of terrible things. They were hungry, they were thirsty, they were struggling to find their own cohesive identity, and they struggled every single day to identify that it was, in fact, God leading them through the wilderness and not their own sense of power in the space. So we see them build a golden calf while also sitting under the shadow of God resting on the top of a mountain. You see, it's an easy, it's a normal thing that we all do, and we're not sure what exactly it is God's doing. We live into our agency to decide for ourselves. And so these people who walk through the wilderness, they end up on the precipice of walking into the promised land, and Moses is told that he cannot go in because he failed to trust. Several generations later, these people who were once slaves are in this promised land, and the child of King David, the one whom everybody looked to as a man after God's own heart, that his son Solomon is granted the power to build, to create the temple. And that temple would be so grand and so intentional that it would house the very presence of God. Up until this point, the Hebrew people had been carrying the presence of God on the tabernacle, uh, on uh, uh, on the chest, the Ark of the Covenant. Goodness gracious, I forgot my Indiana Jones trivia for a second there. (laughs) On the Ark of the Covenant. they were they was carried through the wilderness. God settled God's full presence over this Ark of the Covenant, and they were walking with him until they settled down into the holy city. And when settled into the holy city, Solomon was granted the power to build this temple where God would reside permanently. So that's where the temple originated. But then the people, as we often do, especially those in power, started to hedge away from the temple as the center of life, to build new alliances with kingdoms, and in order to build new alliances with neighboring kingdoms, they had to sacrifice a little bit of their own faith, starting making sacrifices to other gods in other kingdoms. And God increasingly gets more and more frustrated and aggravated, and we start to see prophets emerge who talk about how important it is to stay focused on God, lest God decide that God no longer wants to be in the temple where no one is actually paying attention anyway. And then what happens in the year 587 uh, BC is Uh, God grants the power. This is what's in Scripture. God allows, in fact, empowers the Babylonian Empire to come in, 
destroy the city of Jerusalem, cast out all of the descendants of Abraham, and burn the temple to the ground. Well, you know what that means? God's presence is no longer there. The temple's gone. The Ark of the Covenant is gone. God is no longer tabernacling, settling down into this sacred space. God is dispersed away, and so are the people. One of the commentaries I read said that it would be sort of an even larger equivalent to like 9-11. It changes the course of all of their lives in a dramatic and painful way. That it reorients these people who have to rebuild their faith in a foreign land surrounded by foreign gods, stuck And so over time, as Babylon continues to rule over them, a new emperor comes named Cyrus, who issues a decree. And so about 70 years later, after they've been exiled, a new emperor comes in and says, you know what, y'all come back if you want to. Uh, You can come back in, resettle Jerusalem. Uh, You could even rebuild your temple if you want to. And so they come back from exile. Many people settle back into Jerusalem and they start to rebuild Uh, this new temple, which takes several years to do. But what we know is that after the temple is completed, even though it's beautiful and grand, we're told that the people who remembered the original temple, they weep when they see the temple built. Ezra and, and Nehemiah both describe the elders in the community who come back to see this rebuilt temple, they weep. It's not a joyous time. They come back in tears because what they know is that the Ark of the Covenant is not there. God is not tabernacling. God is not settling. God is not holding space. And so the temple is really a shell to what it used to be. And so for years, the temple authority, in an attempt to follow all of the laws that have been given to Moses around sacrificial rites, around the ways that offerings had to be made, around the ways that money was meant to be used in the temple, they try to get back to what the first temple experience was like. So they start to engage. In in order for the offering at the temple to be holy, it couldn't have the imprint of a Roman emperor saying, I am God on it. That's blasphemous. So in the courtyard outside the temple, you have to have a money changer. Because the only currency that people could use, especially when we get to Rome, the only currency that you could use was Roman currency. So if you're going to make your temple offering when you come to worship, the only money that you had would have money saying that there's other guy is God. So you have to exchange it. And if you've got a person there exchanging money, well, they have to earn a living. So you've got to charge some interest on the exchange rate. Right? You see, like it's all, the intentions are good, right? Like we need to keep the space sacred and holy. So we need uh, money changers to be able to convert coinage from Roman coinage to temple coinage. And then if we've got people who are coming from all over the Roman Empire, we need to make sure that they're making clean offerings. We can't have some, you know, non-organic GMO cattle being brought into the temple can't have any of that. So instead, what we'll do is we'll offer in the temple courtyard a space where people can buy unblemished, uh, organic, pasture-raised, beautiful, sacrificial offerings. So then the, the temple courtyard, as they're welcoming folks in for Passover or Yom Kippur or any of the major holidays, they would have out of necessity to follow the law, a market in the courtyard. Do you see how none of these things are bad, right? 
They're an attempt to be faithful. They're an attempt to do the right thing. There's just one thing missing. Could you guess? It's the same answer for us. God. It's the only distinction. What is the motivation? The motivation is to follow the law well, which can never be done perfectly, if not first aligning hearts and minds with the presence of God. Well, what we know from Scripture is that God never dwelled in the second temple. So what exactly were they offering to? Except the idea, the institutional preservation of tradition leading to profit off of people's attempt to worship. This is why Jesus is angry enough to braid together a cord and drive out. I I hope you notice, and especially in John's Gospel, the people are not driven out. The money-changing tables are flipped and the animals are driven out. The people are not driven away. All of the tools of institutional preservation are eliminated. And Jesus begins to speak. And what he says is, I am the temple. You can tear this temple to the ground And in three days, I will build it back up. All of us religious folks would be confused because if you tore this building down, it would take one heck of a lot more than three days to build this. Tear this temple down, and in three days, I will build it back up. Do you see the location of God is shifting in the Gospel of John? God's location isn't in the tabernacle anymore. Another reason we know this is true is the stories told about Antiochus Epiphanes, who uh, it's described really in like a this is several hundred years later, but like 150-ish BC, Antiochus comes in, walks into the Holy of Holies, which should have killed him. You've seen Indiana Jones, right? You know what happens when the Ark of the Covenant, God's full presence. We're talking like bad CGI face melting. Like that's what's supposed to happen in the Holy of Holies. Well, Antiochus walks in and slaughters a pig in the center of it. And then walk safely out. God is not there. Do you see? So if God is not there, where did God go? In the first chapter, the Gospel of John, Jesus is baptized, and you know what happens when Jesus is baptized? Something descends and settles. The Spirit of God settles not into a place, but into a person. In Jesus Christ. And this person, who is both fully human and divine in some mystical way that we don't need to debate over is the one who is calling us, the people of God, back to a full focus. As he walks into the temple, he's reminding the people that 
empty sacrifice, empty offering, just being here for the sake of wanting to be a part of some community without first thinking about the ways that God is challenging us, that God is holding us, that God is calling us, that God is drawing us together into something beautiful and sacred misses the point. We can make our offerings, we can exchange our coins, we can turn our, uh, our tithes in, we can do all of this, but if it's just for the preservation of an institution, we've missed the mark. Our focus needs to be something beyond the very beautiful space that exists in this space, in this church, but needs to instead settle onto the presence of God, which meets us in the eyes of our neighbors, meets us in the beautiful uh, and, and uh, creativity of the people who have painted this, that meets us in the incredible generosity of generations of people who have sacrificed life, who have tried to surround us with not beauty for the sake of beauty, but beauty to point us towards something bigger than ourselves. All of these symbols are just symbols. And to treat them as something more misses the point. Do you see? The temple could be sacred if the intention were correct. And this is really on religious leaders So, Carolyn, hold tight. (laughs) We've got to make sure that the focus of our institutions is not on the preservation of them because we think they're great. Our intention should be on drawing the focus to the presence of God who meets us in Christ. And since the resurrection, that Christ has been dispersed between all of humanity. Little glimmers of the presence of God settles into each of us. Jesus says in the Gospel of John, you will do greater things than this. But that can only be true if we remember who it is that gives us the gifts that we have, who it is that we're meant to be focusing our time and attention on, who it is that we should be offering our lives, our intention, and our attention to. It isn't to me, it isn't to Carolyn, it isn't to Claudia, who's not here, or Patrick, it isn't to the beautiful choir. All of these things are symbols pointing. It isn't towards the beautiful stained glass. It isn't towards the paintings that I forced all of you to look at just a few moments ago. It isn't to the beautiful Gustavino tiling. It's not to the incredible talent of our guest musician. All of these things are symbols pointing towards something bigger than us. So our work is to not be distracted by the beauty of the symbol, but to be drawn in through them to experience the full presence and love of Jesus Christ. That is what the church is actually for. Thanks be to God. May the Lord be with you. Let us pray, O Lord, show thy mercy upon us. O God, may clean our hearts within us. Gracious God, you have heard the concerns of this church in private prayer and in public speaking. You hear the yearnings of each of us, the pain that we carry, the joys that we hold dear. You know all of this. And so we lift it to you as one community, grateful for the ways that you call us, the ways that you hold us, the ways that you allow us to be so beautifully and wonderfully made. God, thank you for our gifts, the ways that they settle into our professions. Help us to remember that they are in fact gifts to be grateful for. God, we're grateful for the finances that we have that allow us some measure of comfort. Let us remember them as gifts to 
be shared in hospitality and gratitude. God, we thank you for friends and family when they're at their best and when they're their most frustrating. All of these are gifts reminding us of an abundance of love and grace and peace. God, for leaders who step up, hoping to carry the burdens of national, city, state leadership, we thank you for the willingness and we trust that you would continue to challenge them to live into the best of what they can be. For all of us who are just trying to make it from day to day, we thank you. We thank you for this day. We thank you for this breath. We thank you for this beating heart. God, we lift up all of those prayers that we carry with us, spoken and unspoken, as we join together our voices, saying, Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Good morning. I'm afraid my speech may uh, be a little bit in conflict with what... (laughs) 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 Anyway... Fortunately, Patrick says it's up to him to correct me and to enlighten me. Um, I'm Lucy Hanna, and I want to tell you why I give to Central. This has been an eventful year for us at Central. I've been thinking about the church a lot lately, because right now I feel as if I have way too much work to do in my day job. As I struggle to get things done, my bosses and colleagues seem angry, and they don't offer any any kind of help, any solutions. Last summer, Barbara Bayon and Marilyn Edwards (coughs) asked if I would chair the committee planning Rebecca's retirement party. The idea of planning such an event for a minister who gave so much to Central for 35 years was truly daunting. At the first planning meeting, before they even asked about my chairing, we brainstormed all the aspects of the party that we needed to consider. What kind of food should we offer? Do we serve alcohol at 11.30 on a Sunday morning? (laughs) Who should speak? What kind of gift would be appropriate? And we had a lengthy discussion of whether Central's neighbors would kill us if we installed a bell in our bell tower in Rebecca's honor. We decided the answer was yes. (coughs) There was also a big nebulous category of things that we lumped into a committee called media and tech that would plan a slideshow items to play on the monitors in Chapel Hall, and many other things. And finally, there was the dreaded, who would clean up after the party? We assigned tasks to those of us present, and this last item we assigned to Liz Vile, who was not present. (laughs) Somewhat reluctantly, I agreed to chair this committee. Two weeks later, we met again, and everyone had completed their tasks, and furthermore, now considered themselves chairs of subcommittees. Almost all these people had recruited members for their subcommittees, researched ways to get things done, 
And then they accepted growing to-do lists with grace. Everyone supported each other, offered help wherever it was needed. My job as the chair was the simplest assignment of all. This church provides all the help I needed. Special events are just that, special. The retirement party, the arrival of Patrick and Susanna are not events that occur often. In fact, God willing, I'll be pushing 100 when Patrick decides to retire. (laughs) But this church surprises me, calms me, buoys me, and embraces me every day. I can trust that I will find help and that I will find fulfillment in ways to give help. Every day, Central is special, and I want to keep it that way, and that's why I give. Please join us after church for the scavenger hunt. All of the, I keep forgetting that y'all sit down. Man, it always is jarring. Wow, that was weird. Y'all can sit down, that's fine. (laughs) Thank you, Susie. I appreciated you just like, whatever. Um, Anyway, uh, what was I saying, Carolyn? Y'all are great. Even better. Oh, yeah, we got some different clothes on today. It's a big day. All of this, none of this fundamentally, at the end of the day, matters. None of it. As we learn on Ash Wednesday, our lives in and of themselves are dust and ash. They glimmer for a moment and fade away. But each life, each life is a perfect reminder of the grace of God. The people who challenge us most help us to know what it means to love even when it's hard. And the people who that we hold most dear, who are the kindest, most gracious people, are reminders of God's abundant love for us, even when we're difficult to love. All of these things are symbols, reminders, nudges towards an abundant love bigger than any piece of it. So as we sit in a beautiful space, and I don't want to detract from that, surrounded by beautiful people, whose lives are complicated but held so dear, may you, as you leave it, remember that these things are just guideposts, those little stone towers on our path of life, leading us on to something more beautiful, more sacred, more holy, and not become the thing that we worship instead. So go from this place, hopefully to a really cool scavenger hunt. I uh, have been all over this church, so I'm going to crush all of you. Uh, (laughs) But I'm really looking to see what the competition looks like. So I hope that you'll stick around uh, for our, our really fun scavenger hunt. But in the meantime, may you go in an abundance of peace. Amen. Thank you so much for joining us this week. If you enjoyed this message, please consider leaving a review on iTunes and sharing it with your friends. If you do share it, be sure to tag us so that we can join in the conversation. If you would like to learn more about our church, you can visit us at centralchurch.us. We hope you have a great week, and we hope to see you back again next week.